This week, Western Ag Network is back out on the road attending the Colorado Cattlemen's Association annual convention and trade show in beautiful Steamboat Springs. And our coverage this week is brought to you by AgRisk Advisors. They provide risk management solutions for ranchers and farmers. To learn more about all of those tools, visit agriskadvisors.com. Well, there was over 300 cattlemen and women attending this year's event in Steamboat. And aside from the talk about higher cattle prices, the Bureau of Land Management's proposed conservation rule was a talking point, not only here in Colorado, but at Livestock Association meetings that are occurring all across Western Ag Network country. We caught up with leaders from the National Public Lands Council who shared more on the BLM's proposed rule. I think that it was totally uh, set up uh, and, and totally um, disregarded the, the federal land users, especially the grazing, the livestock industry, to hold three meetings in, in three states um, and leave all those other folks out, especially when you look at Idaho, Oregon, Washington, the amount of travel that those folks would have had to have undertaken to have taken part in one of those public meetings is totally um, disrespectful and disregarded uh, the livestock industry, the permittees that's affected. Well, and of course, Public Lands Council is a voice for permittees, especially out in Washington, D.C. on all these key issues. So how important was it for PLC to be very proactive in the limited uh, engagement opportunities for this public comment period? It was extremely important. You know, the minute the rule rolled out, we were mobilizing our folks in affiliates across the West to, to get involved and to start putting together their thoughts on this for the comment period. But I think to Tim's point, you know, we got three in-person meetings, and I would say the total number of minutes were quite questions were actually answered in those in those three meetings, maybe five. You know, these were not good faith efforts to get public feedback. It was really a presentation from the BLM. So, you know, we've been working closely with our partners in all of the Western states that are going to be impacted by this. But one of the other things we're pushing for, in addition to just submitting those comments, is more opportunities for people to speak with BLM in person, get those questions answered. This is something that is not going to work if it's not developed in collaboration with permittees. Now, a lot of people will see this rule and say, well, this is a conservation rule. Why, why, are, why are producers not on board? Why are other uh, uh, interests that utilize uh, multi-use, uh, why are they not on board with this rule? Conser everybody wants conservation to be a key priority. That's what we, you know, we are stewards of the land as farmers and ranchers and, and grazers. So I guess what, uh, what is the rose colored glasses approach, I guess, with this rule for, for some out in DC? That's a great question, and I think the title is kind of disingenuous because we're all on board with conservation. Permittees want to make sure that the land is healthy, sustainably managed, and, and also for sustained yield, what we say you know, under FLIPMA of having beneficial use and sustained yield. I think what's different in this rule is that the BLM has created a system under their so-called conservation leasing system where it's up to other parties, third parties, to come in and say what they think is a, a, a use that com is compatible with conservation. And our concern is that in a lot of cases, and everybody across the West can think of a group that would think this way, there's gonna be a lot of groups who say, well, pulling all the cows off is the best thing for this land. Not grazing is what's best for conservation. We don't agree with that. Science doesn't support that. And it certainly runs contrary to the BLM's mission of, of multiple use management. So we're concerned that the rule through its conservation leasing system and through its emphasis on designating what's called areas of critical environmental concern is going to create an environment where there's a huge pressure to reduce AUMs, to cut AUMs, to pull, you know, pull back on permits across the West. And we don't think that that actually is compatible with conservation. It's certainly compatible with the views of people who, you know, don't like grazing on public lands, but it's not true conservation. And I guess as that process goes in there, like we understand what a, what a livestock lease looks like on these federal lands. What would the time period be and uh, you know, how, how does that actual lease work in the proposal for these conservation leases to, and uh, the different classifications that come with it, as you mentioned? That's a great question. A lot of those details haven't been filled out yet, honestly. We're looking at very different time frames that the BLM's considering, you know, one year, five years, 10 years. I think that's something that we have to clarify in our comments. And 
and, and frankly, we can give an opinion, but it's really on the BLM to clarify what they think that's going to look like, what system they want to uh, put in place there. I think, you know, anything that runs on a different timeline than grazing permits is going to pose obvious problems with, you know, when things are being renewed and when uh, the lease is going into effect. I think it also is worth mentioning that this is all running separate but parallel to land use planning revisions. And so those all happen on different timelines, different cycles as well. And sort of none of these things are syncing up right now. And that's not going to yield very good results on the land. And it certainly creates a, a bureaucratic nightmare for the BLM who wants to do this and more importantly for the permittees who are going to be impacted by it. So Tim, is there a possibility that there could be a conservation lease placed on top of your grazing lease? Is that, uh, I know there's a lot of uncertainty, but, but could that possibly happen? Yes, very, very much so. In fact, that's been one of the BLM's talking points is that these uh, conservation leases would overlay our livestock leases or or other multiple use leases. So yes, it, it can be laid right over the top of my grazing lease. And according to them, then the conservation use would have some elevated preference, if you will, over my livestock grazing permit. And obviously there's that risk too, if this rule does go forward and is implemented, if a, if a grazing lease is removed or uh, this conservation lease replaces it, most likely that will never become a grazing lease again. Is that kind of the assumption? I think that's a, a very real possibility. And the way that it's written now, there's no clear direction after a conservation lease expires, is the next lease required to, to honor what you're talking about here of the historic use, whatever the previous use of that allotment was. If it was a grazing lease or grazing permit that maybe expired, maybe the person's pulling out, it's changing hands, that, that allotment is changing hands. There's no clear guarantee that the following conservation lease needs to, to honor that. So there is a real possibility for pretty widespread loss of permits here. Now, in addition, the, the public comment period was very short. And as we mentioned, only three in-person events. The rest was all digital comments as well. And uh, PLC, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, state PLC, and cattle organizations have been pushing to expand that comment period so the true stakeholders can, can have their, uh, their say in the rulemaking process. But uh, what was it, 105 days is the initial request to extend it? And, and what, what did it turn out? It, they took a zero out of their side. Somewhere. They sure did. I guess shoot high because it's always going to be trimmed down. But we requested an extension of 105 days given the enormous scope of this rule and the enormous number of questions that need to be answered in the comment period. Uh, and they gave us a 15 day extension. So that's far short of what we think is appropriate. Um, that new deadline for comments is July 5th. And we will be, you know, getting our deadline in, uh, getting our comments in before the deadline there. But again, there's just a lot of issues with the process of how this came about. And it's not just grazers. We heard just this past week, a letter came out from a coalition of solar uh, companies, including BP, Avantis, really big names in the renewable energy space, who are also saying this wasn't enough time. We're not pleased with the rule. So, you know, there's there's concern across the multiple use uh, community. Now, for the folks uh, watching this or, or, or tuning in, uh, uh, listening to our audio tracks, uh, how can they get their comment period, uh, or ex excuse me, submit their comments? How can they work with PLC or their state associations to craft those? Because it is important to have a unique perspective on these and not just have a copy and paste approach to the, the, the public comment period. Absolutely. So publiclandscouncil.org is going to be your first stop there. It's got my contact information. It's got Caitlin's contact information. We can put you in touch with your PLC uh, representatives in each state. Uh, and beyond that, you know, we've got a couple different options for people to get plugged in. PLC has comments that individuals and, and different, you know, groups and cooperating agencies can sign on to. We're also happy to help you develop your own. If you want to do a distinct set of comments, that's something that we can assist with as well. So publiclandscouncil.org is your first stop there, but we'll get you in touch and get you plugged in with the folks in your state who are working on this. For the entire conversation with the Public Lands Council, Secret Johans and Tim Canterbury, click on the link provided in our bio. Of course, they're on YouTube and Facebook Live and online at westernagnetwork.com. Well, hey, there's a lot of news that our team did cover this week, separate from our coverage here in Steamboat. Russell Nimitz is standing by with some of the top stories that we shared here on the Western Ag Network. All right, thank you, Lane. Well, the USDA is now accepting nominations for county committee members, and Farm Service Agency Administrator Zach Ducheneau says that the farmers and ranchers that serve on these FSA committees 
continue to play a critical role in the day-to-day -day operations of the agency and truly serve as the eyes and ears of the very producers who have elected them. The county committee is really unique in the federal system. Citizen stakeholders actually have a voice in the delivery and administration of policy and programs at the local level. Producers represent their local administrative area and offer their perspective with regard to eligibility for payments, production practices, really bringing that local input to program delivery. Now all nomination forms for this year's election must be postmarked or at least received by the local FSA office by August 1st. Elections will actually occur later this year. In the meantime though, for more information, please contact your local USDA Service Center. In some other news, the continuing trend toward local food sourcing has certainly put hometown butchers and specialty meat shops back on the radar of likely lamb consumers. In fact, this month, the American Lamb Board has connected with 50 of these U.S. businesses through its new Butcher Box Direct Mail Kit. They say the goal is to re-engage with this important audience for long-lasting relationships that lead to increased sales of U.S. lamb. The initial 50 butchers also have a chance to be selected as one of 25 American lamb ambassadors to help advocate for delicious and American lamb. For more information on this new list and of course places to buy lamb, please visit AmericanLamb.com. In some grain industry news, Hey, it looks like the U.S. Wheat Associates recently hosted a South and Southeast Asian marketing conference in Thailand. It was the very first conference in that region since 2012, if you can believe it, and comes at a challenging time for the milling and wheat foods business there. Now, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee's Denise Conover says that Asia continues to be a very important market for U.S. wheat growers. Absolutely, uh, especially here in Montana, 80% of our crop goes, it's exported. And so uh, that doesn't leave a lot for, com uh, for just um, com commercial use in the U.S. So those, those markets to us are very important. And speaking of the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, we certainly want to send out our congratulations to Fort Benton's and our dear friend Mike O'Hara, who just recently retired off of the board after serving nine years on the committee. In some other news, you know, as you've heard me say before, food insecurity is a real thing even out here in rural America. And in Wyoming, cattle producers are helping with the fight against hunger by participating in First Lady Jenny Gordon's Wyoming Hunger Initiative Beef for Backpacks program. So what we have done, we started with Laramie County. They've been doing 1,100 beef sticks a week for 17 weeks. We had ranchers donate seven beef for that, and we were able to pay for the processing. And so we want to take that actually statewide to the other counties who have backpack programs that are helping the folks in their communities. Wyoming Beef Council Chair Eamon O'Toole says it's a great partnership. The Wyoming Beef Council started the Beef for Backpack several years ago and then uh, it worked perfectly for the First Lady's Hunger Initiative and it's been a great partnership since we got together on it and we're still um, using producer dollars to do the labeling for those uh, beef sticks and boy it's great for the kids and we're getting great feedback about it. And the First Lady encourages everyone to pay it forward and participate in the Wyoming Hunger Initiative Beef for Backpacks program. Everyone is just in one emergency away from being in need. So really understanding that if you're able to help now, those people will be able to pay it forward. So um, I think that's what we do in Wyoming best is help our neighbors. Now cattle producers interested in helping to end hunger in the Cowboy State can learn more about donating animals to the Hunger Initiative Beef for Backpacks program by visiting NoHungerYO. Org. Well, farm and biotech groups are applauding U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai's recent announcement 
that the Biden administration will take on Mexico in a dispute over Mexican biotech corn restrictions. Colorado Corn Promotion Council President Rod Hahn says that it's a very important issue for corn growers and rightfully so. Over 40% of our ag exports in Colorado, pork, bean, dry beans, uh, corn, goes to Mexico. So it's a very important market for us. And we're a member of Grains Council. Uh, we got three members on that. And we are constantly monitoring that. But the thing is about the, the uh, non-GMO corn for human consumption, that's just a step in the door. Eventually, it's non-GMO corn for animal consumption. We eat animals. And so therefore, uh, every ag commodity has taken a, an interest in this. And National Corn Growers has taken a big interest and said, you know, this has got to stop. Now, even though the process is likely to stretch on for months, groups like the National Corn Growers Association and U.S. Grains Council say they're confident that in the end, they'll come out on the winning side. And finally, it looks like a new survey out from One Country Project or OCP shows that voters still think that health care in rural communities is far worse than what we see in the rest of America. They say the findings were revealed basically right after OCP hosted its recent and annual Rural Progress Summit. Now, stakeholders from across the U.S. gathered to discuss challenges facing rural communities and the importance of elevating rural priorities on the national stage. Access to quality and affordable health care shouldn't be determined by your zip code, says OCP founder and former North Dakota U.S. Senator Heidi Heitkamp. Now, more than 130 rural hospitals have closed since 2010 alone. That, they say, now leaves rural residents with no option but to travel hours to the nearest medical center, which is especially dangerous in a life-threatening emergency. Well, for more ag news, please visit us online at westernagnetwork.com or check out our YouTube channel. And of course, you can find ag news and markets 24 seven on our Facebook and Instagram pages. Ready for a real PRF partner? He was willing to track us for a year and provide that data back to us for a year that's a guy making a pretty big investment. At Ag Risk Advisors, this isn't our first rodeo. We are one of the most experienced in pasture rangeland forage. Honesty, commitment, trust. Many companies use these words. At Ag Risk Advisors, we earn them. Each year, the Colorado Cattlemen's Association, along with the Colorado Cattlemen's Land Trust and other stakeholder groups, award the Leopold Conservation Award to a ranch or landowner, recognizing their work in voluntary conservation on private land. This year, the Lavalle Ranch of Hotchkiss was honored with the award. Oh, uh, when we first heard we won the award, I just, I didn't know what to think, you know. But as it's gone on, I'm thinking, wow, this is uh, pretty special for the ranch. And Ross, for yourself, being that next generation, being a part of it, uh, uh, what's it mean to come here and, and be recognized for your your work, your, your dad's work, but your entire family's generational work in conservation? Oh yeah, it's a big honor to receive this award. You've seen the other ranches that have won and what the award means, you know, with us being on private and public land, the conservation efforts that we put into it, it's nice to be recognized. And then uh, it's very, just a big honor to be included in, with the names and other outfits that have been given this award. Now, let's just talk about the history uh, of your family ranch. Uh, how many generations is it? And just uh, the role that it plays in Colorado agriculture, Mark? Yeah, so Ross will be the fifth generation to come back to the ranch. Um, you know, I think every, gener every one of our generations has added a little ranch, another piece of property to the place, you know, and uh, so we started out back in the late 1800s and uh, just, it's just evolved. Uh, it's kind of gone like this, but it's, you know, you just keep adding to it and fighting the drought and 
and getting along. So that's kind of how we got to where we are today. And a lot of our conservation is because we were, uh, you know, we had to change what we were doing because of the drought or, or different situations. And so it, it's brought us to get innovative and do irrigation projects and do this and that and pipelines and to get water to cattle where we didn't have it before. So for our viewers that maybe aren't from Colorado, let's just talk about the part of the state you're in, what that terrain looks like, and then the type of cattle you're raising as well. So we're in uh, south central Colorado, um, southwestern Colorado, I should say, uh, about the center of the state, a little town called Hotchkiss. We're south of that is, is our main headquarters. It's kind of high plateau country where we run. It's fairly dry country. Uh, we get about 13 inches of moisture a year. Um, we uh, have a kind of a high desert area where we can stay out most of the year. We have to come in in uh, late November and, and we go back out in May. A uh, lot of, we irrigate about uh, 800 acres and um, we run on about uh, six, 7,000 acres of private ground yep. plus our BLM and forest. Yep. And uh, Ross, maybe let's just talk about the, the, the <coughs> conservation efforts that you guys have put into place. Obviously, it's a great collaboration with, with a lot of different entities just to, to make a ranch work these days. But uh, you're talking about water lines and everything like that. What, what has that process been like in just working with, uh, with, with agencies and other groups just to be able to have a, have a better impact on the environment and, and have better grazing opportunities as well? Yeah, we jumped through a lot of hoops to get a lot of stuff done that we want to do. Uh, all, the, all that water comes from our private ground and then it goes out into the public land that we graze and but it doesn't just help our cows it helps everything there's a lot of wildlife that call that place home mm -hmm. and uh, obviously we do it for our cows benefit but it helps everything out and uh, we put a lot of effort into keeping that stable out there so that we can use it and then that line it goes a lot of other places too it goes into some other private ground it just keeps everything rolling for us too keep the number keep our numbers up and be able to run the number of cows that we do and otherwise we wouldn't be able to use that country on you know, these dry years because there is no live water we're just relying on ponds and snow runoff and sometimes it's not there yeah well uh you know uh, before we we started having this conversation I, I said i wanted to ask you know mark for yourself what were some of the the conservation practices or ideas that that maybe you brought back to the, the operation as a fourth generation producer, and, and I'll ask Ross the same question, but what were one of those ideas that maybe uh, your forefathers were like, what the heck? Because I always joke, when I came back from college, I stacked hay a little different because they taught us how to do that. My dad always jokes, you learn that in college because <laughs> where we where our place is out in Montana, it, it didn't work how they wanted us to stack yeah. it in college, but yeah. uh, so we always joke, did you learn that in college? But what were some practices or ideas that you brought back that maybe were implemented right away or implemented over, over several years? You know, I think a lot of it is, uh, was, beef and, uh, was improvement with our cattle, uh, genetic improvements we've made to uh, get more pounds of beef off the of same amount of acreage. As far as uh, some other ideas, you know, at 2002, I graduated from college in 80, but when 2002 was probably the first drought that I had to experience running the ranch, big time drought. We had 177, but it was just a year. But anyway, that's, I thought we got to do something because we're out of water. We can't even irrigate or raise enough for our cattle. So Bureau of Reclamation, NRCS, we got together and said, we're going to pipe this ditch. And we, since then, we put up six center pivots and we are now delivering water year round to our place where we couldn't before. And uh, so that's made a huge difference in my part. And it's something I can hand to these boys of ours that can take off and go from there and try to do better. Yep. Ross, what, what is something you and your brother maybe have talked about or tried to implement and, and had those conversations uh, at the kitchen table? A lot of the conservation stuff was already in play uh, when I've been moved back and uh, it's had a good system. So we've just kind of rolled with that. Uh, we've done, uh, with my ideas, we've kind of worked with the genetics a little bit on some of these cows. Um, just kind of improving them more and more as we can, getting them, raising some cattle that are just good for our country, you know, with a high elevation and then also being kind of out on a high desert too in the spring, so they got to travel to water a lot. So we got a lot of uh, heterosis and longevity in our cattle and then also uh, having some high elevation genetics because they end up getting to 9,000 feet in their in the middle of the summer so kind of got to cover all boards and stay healthy and be able to keep those calves alive coming off the forest permits and high country ground and coming home 
You know, uh, obviously, uh, the Leopold Award uh, is, is a great recognition for the hard work of all the generations of, of your family operation, but there's a, a lot of other producers out there, too, that uh, uh, that work on behalf of the land and their animals and, and are stewards of their land and, and conservationists as well. But, you know, this, this award really puts a highlight on your operation, too. How important is it, especially in a state like Colorado, where voters play a big role in, in production agriculture and, and our landscape and our wildlife management? How important is it, though, to, to tell your ranch's stewardship story uh, through this honor as well? Well, you know, I think it's a lot, especially with the sage grouse. We have endangered sage grouse population on our, on our BLM and on our private ground. And, you know, we're, we've been able to showcase what we've done there so we can both survive because the grazing would probably be on the way out in favor of the grouse if, if they had their way. But we've, we've been able to show that we can, we can coexist and, and the water that we put in those pipelines favors the grouse. And uh, we got a rest rotation put in. And, and so, you know, this just exemplifies it, you know. And, and uh, my wife's done a lot of work too uh, along the way on, on the range improvements, you know, and just knows range very well. And so that's, that's something she's handed to this guy and helped helped get along. And what's that been like learning from your mom as well? Robbie LaValle, of course, is, is who we're speaking of. We've interviewed her a lot here on the network, but what, what, what does that mean? Oh, she's taught me a lot, um, especially just grazing some of that public ground where a lot more things are just uh, very touch and go and uh, just treating the ground right so it uh, takes care of you. Same thing with the cattle. You know, there's uh, especially in this state that we're in, you know, everything, politics and everything plays into it, but it's still a very ag-based state, so, you know, we're ha we've had a good year this year with moisture, and so we're gonna hopefully reap some benefits from it, but, you know, you take care of the livestock in the ground, and it'll take care of you. And these calf prices are pretty nice to see right now, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's nice, nice to be in the business. Nice to be in the business. We yeah. wish we all had a few more head of cattle with these nice prices, yeah. but <laughs> we your banker, know the game. Yeah, <laughs> your banker waves at you going down the street. Life's good. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, what's a message you have to the Sand County Foundation, who, of course, administers the Leopold Award, the Colorado Cattlemen's Ag Trust, or the Colorado Cattlemen's Association? What's the last message you just have to them and the supporters of, of this great conservation award? Well, I think I, I really appreciate them looking at us and saying, you know, you guys are it. We think you're the best this year, and and uh, I appreciate their their support of us and all the partners that are in there. It's amazing how many collaborative people you can get along with, you know. And they're all wanting one thing: they want some conservation. They like to see wildlife. And they like to see us on the land taking care of it, and that's that's why we're that's what we're about. Now, this is just one example of all the voluntary conservation work that ranchers do on both private and federal land each and every day. Again, a big congratulations to the Valley family for their hard work and receiving the Colorado Leopold Award. Well, from here in Steamboat, let's go back to the home studio there. Russell Nimitz is standing by. He's going to share a little more on how those agriculture markets shaped up this past week. All right. Thanks a lot, Lane. Well, this past week, Northern fed cattle traded for mostly 290 bucks, which is about $6 softer than the previous week's weighted average. Well, Southern live cattle this past week traded for mostly $180, which is only about $2 softer than the previous week. Now keep in mind on Friday, those live cattle futures ended lower on this past week's softer cash cattle as well as some lower to mixed boxed beef prices. While well, feeder cattle futures on Friday at the closing bell actually pushed a little bit higher, of course, on some of those lower corn prices we saw as we wrapped the week up. But the big news happened in Billings, Montana. That's because Northern Livestock Video Auction kicked off their 2023 summer video sale season with their early summer special. And Joe Goggins told me what a difference a year makes when it comes to calf prices. 
You know, it's been remarkable. Uh, it, it's exceeded our expectations. Uh, we started out this morning with these light calves. A lot of them, uh, uh, those calves weighing under five, bringing in that 320 to 340 range. Uh, sold a lot of the five weight steers uh, kind of in that $3 to 320 range. So uh, uh, right off the bat, gotten them midweight cattle. A lot of them midweight steers bringing 270, 280. We're just getting in right now to these big steers uh, out of Montana. And uh, looks like a lot of those steer calves are going to be bringing from uh, 17 to 1900, a little over 19. 1900 on the big, big uh, kind of reputation one. So it's uh, what a difference a year makes. A pretty good time being the cow business, and uh, uh, it just kind of proves uh, when the good Lord shines a little on us and uh, and gives us some moisture, and we can try to cheapen up some of these input costs around. Uh, everybody can live. He says even with the corn market on the rise, short cattle supplies have certainly put cow calf producers back in the driver's seat. Yeah, it is. Uh, right now, you can sure see the uh, the guys that owns the grass, the guys that sells grass, the guy that has the ranches has got the leverage right now and uh, probably will have for some time. And we, we're seeing a lot of these producers aging out and uh, dispersing their cow herds and putting land into uh, uh, things other than than livestock production, whether it be lamb or beef production. And uh, so uh, it uh, those of us that can kind of steady the course and, and, and kind of keep these ranches stocked with some beef and some cattle, uh, uh, we got some good times ahead of us. And he says the program cattle continue to bring a premium compared to some of their counterparts. They are. The, uh, these cattle uh, that uh, we're sure seeing a premium to these cattle that, that got the bells and whistles, if they're all natural or the gap or the NHTC even, uh, but these cattle, the, the people that have gone through the effort of going through an audit and, uh, and getting some added value to their cattle are sure getting paid for it today. Uh. Now, Northern Livestock Video's next sale is their summertime classic running July 24th through the 26th with the deadline for consignments on July 7th. In the meantime, for more information, please contact your local representative or visit northernlivestockvideo.com. Well, this past week, we did see quite a few feeder and slaughter lambs sell across Western Ag Network country. In fact, last Monday in Billings at the public auction yards, those 60 to 80 pound feeder lambs sold between 180 and 210 with 80 to 100 pound lammy selling 201 up to 208. Slaughter lambs sold between 175 and 211. Last Wednesday in Fort Collins, Colorado, lighter weight feeder lambs there were 145 up to 165, and slaughter lambs between 190 and 235. And finally, on Friday, wheat futures ended a little bit softer following the row crops lower. Harvest progress is likely to pick up, they say, for winter wheat with better rains in the north starting to develop with trade able to firm a bit off the early lows again. KC wheat, they say, should get closer to average pace by this coming week on harvest. The dollar also worked back from the lower end of the range with some wheat traders out there giving some gains with some Black Sea weather concern ticking up a little bit this past week. Meanwhile, corn futures gave back a lot of this past week's gains to help ease some of those overbought conditions. Keep in mind, for more agricultural markets, you can always visit us online at Western Ag Network. Dot com. Well, sixth generation Colorado cattle rancher Aaron Carney has been a key part of the Colorado Cattlemen's Association since 2015. But last fall, she became the first woman in CCA's 156 year history to lead the organization as its executive vice president. Lane, I would say this was one of our uh, most attended uh, and biggest conventions that we've had in recent history. And you know, we can't think of a better setting than Steamboat Springs to host our meetings. But, um, you know, there's a lot of fun that comes with the convention, but it's ultimately down to business and down to policy. And I would say um, in a state like Colorado, we're facing a number of issues um, coming down the line, uh, especially related to water and wolves and just the changing climate. Um, and I mean the political climate in Colorado. And so, uh, oh, you can see a number of sessions uh, related to wolves um, as there's a lot of uncertainty <laughs> around uh, the upcoming uh, reintroduction of wolves. And then, you know, thankfully in Colorado, we see um, behind us, we see the green setting on the mountain and, and that's what the majority of Colorado is looking for like. And we're just so happy to see um, 
some relief from drought uh, all across the state. And I can tell you, it has helped the mood of producers uh, this week. Well, and that's one thing too with that wolf reintroduction plan. If we can go back to the discussion around wolves, that was a complex process, a lot of different stakeholder input to cross across the board from the livestock industry, outdoor animal side of uh, animal rights side of things as well. Uh, how key was it for CCA to to have a voice on behalf of its members in drafting that policy for wolf management in the state, since the citizens of Colorado voted in to reintroduce wolves? You know, CCA has been a part and uh, in fighting and, and trying to represent our producers uh, since the very beginning before even when we got word that there was a potential ballot initiative and we put together a coalition of ag groups uh, to fight the ballot initiative and it lost by a very, very narrow margin. And so since then, uh, we've had producers engaged in the stakeholder advisory group, the technical advisory group, which ultimately advised uh, the state management plan coming out of the, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission. Um, that was passed unanimous, unanimously uh, in May. Um, and now uh, the other two approaches that we were kind of tackling uh, was legislatively um, as one of the things that was up in the air was our compensation piece and actually having a dedicated fund for livestock compensation and um, that was signed by the governor uh, in the first part of June. So thankfully, we now have that dedicated pot of money. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we really worked hard on is, um, you know, here in Colorado, once the wolves are uh, introduced, they'll be listed as endangered. And so uh, we're working to make sure that we get uh, a 10-J rule um, under the Endangered Species Act so that we can have some management flexibility on the introduce wolves and uh, one of the pieces that we tried in the state legislature this year is to um, wait until to put wolves on the ground until that 10j is in place and um, if you've seen the news you know that the governor vetoed that and uh, we're we're going back to the drawing board to figure out what to do but um, just uh, I know that we're working with Fish and Wildlife Service to ensure uh, that that 10J is in place um, before wolves are put on the ground. Well, we all know that Colorado is expected to double in uh, population by the year uh, 2030, so it's even more critical for participation uh, of ranchers to become CCA members and be engaged. And, and we should add CCA is the uh, oldest state livestock association in the nation. Uh, what, what, what does that mean to producers knowing that CCA has been there and will be there for producers no matter who's in office or, or who's going to be moving down the road, but just advocating on behalf of uh, the, the cattle industry? Absolutely, Lane. You know, I think there's a deep pride uh, throughout the state of Colorado Cattlemen's Association and just the legacy that it holds in Colorado and the legacy. You know, when, when cattlemen come to town, um, especially down to the state capitol, um, no matter what, where we are, legislators listen. And um, I think it's really important uh, now more than ever that, that we um, have membership, we have engaged membership, and we're, and we're talking to our legislators throughout the state. You know, uh, this year it was different um, down at the state capitol, and we have a, uh, one of the newest, we had over 30 new legislators, brand new, and so there's just um, a lot of education that our producers are engaging in right now to ensure that uh, we have better policies and we have better informed policies that come to the table next legislative session. Now, uh, you took the role as executive vice president back in August, and uh, you're the first woman to serve as executive vice president in the over 150-year history of CCA. Uh, what does that mean to you to, to, to be, be a role model for all the, the young girls in agriculture, and, uh, and what's it mean just to be able to lead this organization? Yeah, thanks. Um, one of the coolest things for me is that I grew up in this association, and so uh, we have a Junior Colorado Cattlemen's Association, and I um, was active in that. And so since I was uh, eight years old, I've been a part of this association. <laughs> selling the cards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah selling the raffle tickets um, <laughs> and bugging everyone. Uh, and. And you know, one of my fondest memories is going is our Pueblo convention, and my great grandma was actually um, 
recognized as one of the outstanding cattle women um, for her contribution to the cattle women organization. And since that day, I've always said, you know, I really want to be a part of the association. Um, I've seen the importance of the association, and I think it's important, no matter where you come from, who you are, um, to be engaged and, and to represent the industry on issues. And, you know, we're pretty young kids in the industry still. <laughs> uh, you know, what, what does it mean to you just to, to be able to, to know that you're a part of the uh, load oldest livestock association in the nation, but also bringing in a little bit of uh, what we've learned from all of our forefathers, but looking ahead to the future of the livestock industry. Well, I guess, what's your perspective on that as a young young person, a producer, but also an executive vice president? Absolutely. You know, I am amazed. Um, you know, when you go to the Capitol or you go to any um, organization, uh, CCA is hold a lot of respect and um, I, I've i worked for the association for eight years and until you know from August to now um, the number of calls that I've gotten um, surprised me and I was and it and it's really really cool to see that we still hold that respect people still want to know what the cattlemen cattle women are thinking and um, we're respected for our opinion so um, you know I think we're going to have to adapt to the changing um, Colorado, and you can see behind us just the development that a number of communities in Colorado are facing, and we're going to have to um, figure out how to how to work um, with them. But also, we have to hold true to the, those foundational values, and I think um, we have pretty solid foundation um, and a pretty deep foundation um, to make sure that we're we're sticking to that. No doubt a great leader and advocate for Colorado's livestock industry. With that, friends, thanks for joining us for this special Western Ag Network report out on the road, brought to you by our friends at Ag Risk Advisors. On behalf of Russell Nimitz, videographer Paul Humphrey, and the entire Western Ag Network crew, I'm Lane Nordlund. We'll catch you next time.